Nuclear fission. Without it, there would be no nuclear reactors and no atomic bombs. But what happens when an atom fissions? Also, fissions can lead to a chain reaction. What is a chain reaction, and can a chain reaction be controlled? That's what we're exploring today on the Atomic Age. Before we get started, let's first define a few terms. Fission, fissionable, and fissile. Fission is a technical term for splitting an atom. Some radioactive atoms can fission suddenly, called spontaneous fission, as a form of radioactive decay. However, we usually use fission to describe when an atom is split by a neutron. A fissionable atom is one that can be split with a neutron that has some base energy level, that is, a neutron that's moving. If the neutron is too slow, the atom will harmlessly absorb or scatter, also known as bouncing off, the neutron. A fissile atom is a fissionable atom, with one important difference. A fissile atom can fission if it absorbs a neutron of any energy, including neutrons with no energy. That is to say, a neutron that's not moving. No matter what kind of energy your neutron has, it can always fission a fissile atom. Therefore, fissile atoms are easier to fission than fissionable atoms. This is like how a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not always a square. A fissile isotope is fissionable, but a fissionable isotope is not always fissile. Nuclear reactors and nuclear bombs would not exist without fissile isotopes, and this is precisely because of how much easier it is to split a fissile isotope versus a fissionable one. So what are some examples of fissile and fissionable isotopes? First off, fissile isotopes are much rarer than fissionable isotopes. For uranium, the fissile isotope uranium-235 makes up just about 0.7% of the uranium found in nature. The rest of the uranium is basically uranium-238, and it is a fissionable isotope. For a reactor, you typically want uranium-235 to be at least 5% of the uranium atoms. And for bombs, you want the U-235 to be at least 80%. How do you get uranium with higher percentages of U-235? You enrich it, of course. However, that's a topic for another video. Just know that enriching uranium is a highly complex, highly technical, highly difficult, and highly expensive task. Besides U-235, there are only three other known fissile isotopes. Uranium-233, plutonium-239, and plutonium-241, all of which must be made in a reactor. More on that later. Just know that much effort is required to collect significant amounts of fissile material. So let's talk about fission. To talk about neutron chain reaction, first we must talk about what happens when an atom fissions. Well, we get a lot of smaller pieces. The biggest pieces from an atom fission are two or more highly radioactive fission products. These are the smaller atoms that the original atom has fissioned into. For example, uranium-235 may split into rubidium-90 and cesium-143. We'll also get some gamma rays, a few free neutrons called prompt neutrons because they are created precisely at the moment of fission, more on this later, and a lot of energy. The exact number of neutrons from any one fission is variable, but for a specific isotope, it averages out to a well-known and predictable value, much like how half-life is well-known and predictable for any given radionuclide. For example, uranium-235 averages around 2.4 neutrons per fission, while plutonium-239 averages around 2.9. What happens if you have a bunch of fissions at once? Well, a neutron chain reaction can start. For a chain reaction to start, the prompt neutrons from the first fission need to find other atoms to fission, and then those resulting prompt neutrons need to find more atoms to fission, and so on and so on. From this, we can logically deduce three different chain reaction outcomes. One where we have fewer fissions over time, one where we have more fissions over time, and one where we have a constant number of fissions over time. The first scenario is called subcritical. This means we're getting fewer and fewer fissions over time, thus fewer and fewer prompt neutrons, which means even fewer and fewer fissions, etc. 
Our fission rate is decreasing over time, which means our system cannot sustain a chain reaction, and we cannot have a nuclear reactor or a nuclear bomb. For example, if we have unenriched natural uranium, which is only about 0.7% fissile U-235 by weight, any neutrons from fission will have a hard time finding other atoms of U-235 to fission among all those U-238 atoms. This is a problem because U-238 is not fissile. It will absorb our neutrons, but not fission. There are several other factors that determine the criticality of a system. However, that's a topic for another video. Just know that unless some significant factor is changed in the subcritical system, subcritical systems are safe and will not cause chain reactions. The second scenario is called supercritical. We're getting more and more neutrons made through each cycle of fissions, so our fission rate is increasing over time. Supercriticality is what happens in atomic bombs and in some nuclear accidents like Chernobyl or criticality accidents. Let's consider the following example. So if an atom bomb has a supercritical chain reaction where more and more neutrons are made over time, what's to keep it from fissioning forever and consuming the universe? Well, as the bomb explodes, the fissile material inevitably spreads apart. When it gets too spread out, the neutrons can't find other atoms to fission. Dispersion of a fissile material is another one of the factors for a chain reaction. Wait, what was that other thing I mentioned? Criticality accidents? A criticality safety accident is when fissile material is arranged in such a way that you get a supercritical chain reaction in nuclear material processing and handling like when enriching fissile material, producing reactor fuel, or during the transportation of fissile material. While not anywhere near as powerful as an atomic bomb, they are extremely dangerous in terms of radioactive dose to humans. Not as many people are familiar with criticality accidents, so I plan to spend a fair amount of time discussing them. Also, they're a lot like airplane crashes in that they're usually quite complex accidents, and the human factor is a very interesting component. The final scenario is called a critical system. So in a critical system, we have a constant number of neutrons being produced over time, which is to say our fission rate is also constant over time. We're not getting any more or fewer fissions than we were previously. I chose to discuss this one last because subcritical and supercritical systems are the easier systems to understand in my opinion. Like walking a tightrope, achieving a perfectly critical system is very hard to do. It is very easy for the reaction to go subcritical or supercritical, and that would happen very quickly. Much more quickly than a human or even a computer system could control. Now, if you have a nuclear reactor, you want it to be perfectly critical, which is also called steady state. This means the reactor will operate at a constant and predictable power level, such that you can reliably generate electricity. If it's subcritical, it won't make any power because the chain reaction will stop, and there won't be any more neutron fissions. This is called stalling a reactor. If the reactor is supercritical, well, just look up a thing called Chernobyl. As I mentioned, a critical system is very hard, borderline impossible to achieve without the aid of some clever designs. This is because neutrons move very, very quickly. A neutron fresh from a fission, called a prompt neutron as I discussed before, can move at 14 kilometers per second. At these speeds, and considering that atoms are very close together, chain reactions can start very, very quickly. Any slight changes in a steady state reactor could quickly cause a subcritical system, which would stall a reactor, or a supercritical system, which could lead to the destruction of the reactor. This would happen in fractions of a second. For example, in the Chernobyl disaster, reactor number four went from a power output of 530 megawatts to likely well over 30,000 megawatts in a matter of moments at least 10 times its maximum rated power output. So how the heck do you maintain a controlled critical system in a reactor? Remember that a chain reaction is basically uncontrollable using only prompt neutrons, the neutrons that come immediately from fissioning an atom. To control a chain reaction, we rely instead on delayed neutrons. Delayed neutrons are released a few seconds to a few minutes after a fission, and they come from the excited fission products, that is, the smaller atoms left over, after an atom fissions. Do note, though, that there are not nearly as many delayed neutrons as there are prompt neutrons. 
To take advantage of delayed neutrons, the reactor is set just subcritical with respect to prompt neutrons, with the knowledge and expectation that delayed neutrons will come and will bring the system to critical as they are emitted slowly over time. These very important delayed neutrons make the reaction very controllable and very predictable. For example, say a reactor running purely on prompt neutrons could double its power every hundredth of a second. With the addition of delayed neutrons, you would increase this to several seconds, so much more predictable. So to sum up, we learned about the terms fission, fissionable, and fissile. We also learned that when an atom fissions, we get many pieces like fission products, gamma rays, and neutrons. When a lot of atoms fission, we can get a chain reaction with three possible outcomes, subcritical, critical, and supercritical. And we also learned about delayed neutrons that make an otherwise impossible critical chain reaction possible. This video has been a lot of fun to make. If you made it this far, it means you really care about nuclear physics, which is awesome. My aim is to educate people on nuclear matters, as I believe we're at a critical juncture in human history, and people need to be informed about nuclear topics to better guide our path to the future. If you liked what you saw, consider checking out my other content and subscribing. Hope to see you then.